So, uh, two Saturdays ago, uh, it was an absolutely beautiful day, if you remember the weather uh, two weeks ago, it was absolutely amazing. So I decided I would go out for a little kayak down along the river uh, in, in, in a little inflatable kayak that I have with two friends. So we had two kayaks, myself and my dog in one, and these two friends, Katarina and Jackmo, in the other kayak. So it was great, 28 degrees, just rowing along, along the river, what could possibly go wrong? And so we got to our destination, the next town down the river, and a friend came and picked us up. And that was all grand. Stopped off for ice cream, all good. Came home, came back here, and realized, my goodness, there was quite the heat emanating off my legs. I could feel it like I'm one foot away, I could hold my hand over my leg and just feel this heat radiating up. And then I, was, I had to do some work with someone uh, for the faith camps who we were looking at videos, and I could just feel my eyes kind of dropping. And then I was beginning to feel somewhat nauseous, and my hands went ice cold, and my feet went ice cold, and my jaw started to kind of chatter. I said, wow, I think I have heat stroke. So I went for a wee nap for myself, and then began a retreat the following, two, uh, two days later, we, uh, we had a retreat, and um, I could hardly bend my knees, just the legs were on fire. All is good now, don't worry. Apparently, um, when Giacomo, the guy uh, I was going kayaking with, when he said, uh, Father Patrick, do you have the sunscreen? I said, sunscreen is for losers. Uh, that's what he said. He said I said that. I don't think I said that, but it's possible. Anyway, point being, point being, uh, it was interesting to see that during the whole three hours of exposure, uh, uh, nothing felt any way untoward whatsoever. Nice gentle breeze off the fresh water, and it was all good. So you're rowing along, and there's actually something, something going wrong, but you can't see it. But eventually you do, okay? And this is a very interesting kind of a thing in, in, in our spiritual lives as well, that not everything we do bears immediate fruit. And that works both ways, for good and for bad. So this is how, like, we might, you might look at those who live a dishonest life and everything seems to be absolutely fine. You look at the kind of you know, places where there's unfortunately an awful lot of corruption, maybe like Mexico, where 95% of the wealth is in the hands of 5% of the people. So you have these haciendas that are just absolutely enormous uh, and these people have you know, armed guards and houses and cars, helicopters, the whole lot, while people are living down in, in the, the rest of the village in absolute squalor. You know, it's just entirely unfair. And you look at this and you go, this is just unjust, this is wrong. When are things going to level out? Or you look at even in our own world and those who seem to kind of live without morals just seem to get on just fine and dandy. And those who are struggling to, to, to live more lives maybe you know, financially find it a bit more challenging or they might end up even losing their job. If you're a pro-life nurse today, for example, it's just going to be that bit harder. So at times you look at this at, 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 at real life situations and it just looks like and this is, this is actually biblical as well. Why is it, Lord, that the evil seem to thrive? Now, obviously, I'm not, I'm not calling people evil, but it's biblical. Uh, why is it that, 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 that those who do good find it more difficult and those who don't care about your law, Lord, seem to do just fine? And this uh, uh, kind of it begs a, a, a deeper question. Because in, in our faith, so much of what we do and so much of what we believe is actually unseen. Right? You receive the Eucharist, great. And if you don't receive the Eucharist, do you suddenly die? No. And if you skip Mass for a month, do you suddenly start to turn all black and shriveled and go, yeah. no, no, you look pretty much the same. You don't turn into a witch if you suddenly stop going to Mass. So, so why go? <laughs> I mean, is this having any effect at all? I mean, if I'm praying or not praying, I'm kind of more or less the same person, so, so why bother? So, there's this kind of spiritual reality. It's kind of like sunburn, that when we're investing in something or doing something, the wages aren't, it's kind of a farmer expression, but the wages aren't always paid in the autumn, right? In, in farming mentality, you, you, uh, you till, you sow, you reap, and all of that work is done from winter up to, up to autumn, and then in the autumn you're paid. In the spiritual life, it doesn't really work like that, in that very often we can be doing what's right and not notice the effect of it immediately.
but ultimately it does come. And that's, that's the difference. Ultimately, it does come. Ultimately, we, the, our wages are paid. It might sound a bit harsh to phrase it that way, but ultimately, what we do makes all the difference in the world. Just we mightn't see it at the time. But ultimately, okay, two little explanations. I, I've mentioned this before, but I think it's just really, really important because it puts everything into such a, an incredible context. Uh, that we see the importance of, of, of choosing virtue, and that is. So, at the end of our lives, we have what's called a, a, a particular judgment. So, I will be, will be judged at the end of my life for my actions, okay? Uh, so, I'm, my, my, I'll be judged personally for what I've done and what I've failed to do. So, when I die, I'll find myself before the Lord, and I'll see that you know, there are certain things that I did well, thank God, and that helped people, and there are certain things that I could have done and didn't do. Okay, so I should have done those, because people were left without, or were left hungry, or were left offended because of things I said or did. Okay, good. There's also another thing, another aspect of our faith, very clear in, in the catechism, what's called the final judgment. And I know some of our, our Protestant brothers find this one a bit difficult to understand because they think, well then, so you're in heaven, but then there's like kind of a, a court of appeal. So if, you, if you're in hell, you could say, Lord, maybe you weren't aware of all of the evidence, so we've come up with something in the meantime. So that's not really how it works. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that those who are in hell can come back out and those who are, who are in heaven can drop down. What the final judgment means is that our, our all-knowing God, who knows all things outside of time, finally shows all of those things to us. So when time has ended, when like, this earth, the, the sun will eventually burn out, the, the, the earth will eventually start spinning out of orbit and just collapse into oblivion. So eventually the earth will history, if you will, here on earth, will, will end. And at that point, we'll have what's known as the final judgment, right? Which means, all of the good I do today, that can actually bear fruit in someone's life, and maybe bring about someone's conversion. And then they have three children. And one of them goes off and gets married and starts a really holy family. One becomes a priest, and one becomes an engineer, and they live really good lives. And that priest listens to, over the course of his career, 14,000 confessions becomes a bishop and ordains nine men who then become priests and minister in nine different cities, each having a population of 10,000. And the engineer has an, another family and a great-grandson becomes a, a wonderful catechist in a very difficult part of Dublin and saves four people from suicide and two girls from having an abortion. Now hang on, we'll go, all go back, back to the beginning. This one person lived a holy life and look at the effects it had and they can all be traced back to this person choosing God on that day so at the end of time we will see the ultimate consequences of all of our choices and again this works both ways as a priest if I had the opportunity to preach the truth and I chose not to and I chose to tell people look you're all fine you're all going to heaven because of that 16 people don't go to confession. Four of those die not in a state of grace. And I'll see the ultimate consequences of my laziness or my lukewarmness for all eternity. You know, uh, like this, because of my, I should have been preaching the truth. Instead, I chose something easier. This guy had a vocation to the priesthood. When he saw me and my lukewarm priesthood, he said, nah, I'm not going to bother. I went off and did something else. And he was supposed to minister in this parish and he was supposed to convert that person. He was supposed to save that girl from suicide and he was supposed to help that, that person choose life. And all these things that could have and should have happened, but didn't because I didn't preach the truth. So it's quite incredible when you think like that, that, that the effect of your actions today doesn't end with today and doesn't even end when you die. When you die, your actions or non-actions, are still having consequences. Now, our hope is that if we're sowing love and if we're sowing hope and if we're sowing like, uh, virtue, then the crop that we have sown continues to bear good fruit long after we're gone. You know, the people who've been affected positively, hopefully, affected by us, will continue to bear fruit and then pass that positive fruit onto the next person, onto the next person, onto the next person. The next generation, next generation. So I'm gone, I'm long gone, I'm even forgotten. 
people might not even have known where their faith came from, but it came from my great granny who converted and so on. Like, all those things are forgotten, but ultimately, I'm the fruit of their faith. You know? So we don't even, we can't even trace it back ourselves, but our all knowing, all loving God knows this. So at the, the, the final judgment, I see the ultimate consequences of everything I've done or not done. So when you imagine now, kind of fast forward, oh sorry, not fast forward, but kind of rewind back to today. Can you now see the importance of your choices today? Like if we're tempted to uh, infidelity in marriage, eh, nobody will know, nobody will know. Do you not see that God sees, that God knows? And if your wife finds out, or if the mistress lady goes public with it, and then your, your children lose their father lose all respect for you. The consequences that it'll have on their lives and then on their children's lives. And on their, like, do you not see the, the, the effects of my choices today are far bigger than I could ever imagine or understand. And that works, I say, both ways. It can also work positively. Me choosing virtue, me choosing to renounce myself uh, for, in favor of my family, me choosing to renounce myself as a priest in favor of the, of the souls entrusted to me. That bears fruit, a little fruit today uh, but maybe after I'm gone, and off so much more fruit that the people I, I, that the Lord has entrusted to me, if I'm faithful and do what I'm supposed to do and do it right, be an instrument of God, and then each person in turn that I help becomes an instrument of God in their spheres of influence. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people at the end of the day, hundreds and thousands of souls who have an eternal value in God's sight. So it's so, so important that I get today right it's so important that the choices I make today are good not necessarily the easy ones but the right ones that the choices I make are, are, are the choices that the Lord would, would have us make and so everything we do every single choice that we make is so important and every sacrifice we make and every hidden tear and prayer that no one sees absolutely all of it has such a value in God's sight. It's incredible. The hidden prayers, and when you're in a car or you're in your, you're in your bed at night and you're praying, all of this, like it's actually not just a nice little optional extra. It's, it's, it's critical. It's essential that my heart is united to the Lord so that the following day my heart will continue to be united to the Lord and that I can help those that God places in my path. If I'm not praying, I have nothing to give. So, Every, in this context, like everything starts to make sense. The hiddenness of prayer, the hiddenness and simplicity, apparent simplicity of our sacraments. Like the, you receive the Holy Eucharist, you are now receiving God into your heart. The world doesn't see it and, and you don't look necessarily any different. But if I'm drawing from the grace of Christ within me in this Holy Communion to love the following day or that day to, to love those who are difficult to love to forgive those who are impossible to forgive and I draw from that grace of the Holy Eucharist within me and because of that my soul is sanctified this person is forgiven and if they witness that forgiveness and then go on to be forgiving themselves the consequences the consequences for all eternity of our good actions is phenomenal and so much of it begins in this, this hidden way this hidden unity with the Lord, this hidden secret life with the Lord. And our Father, who sees all that is done in secret, will reward us. So all we have is today. Yesterday's finished. I can't do anything about it. I can say sorry, maybe, if I got something wrong. Uh, but I can't change it. can't undo it. Tomorrow hasn't come yet. No point worrying about it. I have today. I have now. So, what am I being called to? And if I plant today, where and when and how the Lord is, is, is calling me to, the, the harvest may be born, may be reaped by someone else. Maybe my, some of it might be reaped by me. It's not really important. What's important is that it's reaped by someone for the greater glory of God. But it starts with, with me getting my bit right, me doing my part. That's all that matters. And then, as I say, ultimately, we will see the effects of everything we've done. And that's, for me, it's just like, it's such a wake-up call. 
because it just means then imagine like if you're a teacher and you belittle some students and then that, that affects their self-worth and then you know they go on to self-harm and then they you know all of the horrific effects that, that can have or again you're you're a parent or you're a a, a, a priest like the, the the effect of of our example is just so so important And so we ask the Lord today. Today's readings in gospel are, are, are about the Eucharist. Again, this, 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 this hidden miracle, this daily miracle of the Lord truly present there. And, he, and he, he does this. He comes to us in this form, not just as a reminder of a, a sacred meal that happened a long time ago, but to be our daily nourishment, to be our daily spiritual nourishment, to be our daily bread. And we need... That daily nourishment, because the battle is daily, the struggle is daily. So we draw from him. And if we do so now, that grace shining through us will help others. And that will help others. And that will help others. And then we die, we're gone, and it's still bearing fruit after we're gone. What a gift. What a gift to be able to do that. So we thank the Lord for this great miracle and privilege of working with him in this hidden way. Some people see it, some people don't, it doesn't matter. It will bear fruit. Maybe not in the autumn, but it will bear fruit in time. So may the good Lord guide us in our mission and in our ministry that all souls may sing with our psalmist. Ring out your joy to God, our strength. Amen.